Hello, everyone. I'm excited to welcome you all joining us from across the globe to today's event, highlighting innovation throughout Forterra's Forest to Home model. If you have not already done so, please let us know where you're joining us from and why this topic is of interest to you in the chat feature of Zoom. My name is Christy Smith, and I'm speaking to you from Denver, Colorado. I have the privilege of leading the Housing Affordability Breakthrough Challenge for enterprise community partners in very close partnership with Wells Fargo. On behalf of both organizations, we thank you for joining today's dialogue as we hear from national and international leaders who will, direct, who will discuss a forest to home strategy that will yield triple bottom line results with environmental, economic, and social benefits. The Housing Affordability Breakthrough Challenge was created to identify and accelerate ideas that could transform how affordable homes are built, financed, and provide a gateway to resident stability and success, all while advancing racial equity and prioritizing environmental sustainability. We created this six-part webinar series to not only highlight each of the six challenge winners, but also create space for leading voices and a diversity of perspectives on a variety of issues that underscore how innovation is imperative to developing new and creating and creative housing affordability solutions. <clears throat> this is the fifth webinar in our six part series. I encourage you to visit housingbreakthrough.org where you can visit, where you can find webinar recordings from earlier this year focused on justice involved housing, affordable home ownership in rural and tribal communities, a new equitable underwriting system and designing trauma resilient communities. You can also register for our final webinar next month, featuring a unique investment structure partnering with healthcare to develop affordable housing. Be sure to, be sure to subscribe to Housing Breakthrough uh, News to learn about the progress of our six winning breakthrough ideas, including Forteras, and stay informed about future events. Before I introduce our moderator, I'll ask Connie Wright, Senior Vice President in Housing Affordability Philanthropy with Wells Fargo to join me in welcoming our audience and panel participants. Connie is an innovator herself, leading in the development of the Housing Affordability Breakthrough Challenge. She remains highly engaged with this initiative to support transformative new solutions across the housing, affordabil the housing affordability sector. Connie. Christy, thank you very much for that introduction. And um, as she indicated, would um, like to welcome you all to the call. I am a part of the Housing Affordability Philanthropy Team for Wells Fargo, and one of um, several that have worked um, very diligently over the last couple of years to meet our commitment around $1 billion in housing affordability. The, the Breakthrough Challenge was the first of our initiatives to seed this very important work, and um, it has really been a great ride. The outcome from this initiative really did I, help us to identify six of the very best um, in this country in the innovative and transformative space. Um, it represents organizations that are small and grassroots. It represents um, rural and urban focus. It represents organizations like Corterra, who has international um, reach. And so uh, we are really excited about the webinar today. Um, it is one that is closely aligned to a lot of the work that we are doing, particularly in the environmental sustainability pillar for the uh, Wells Fargo Foundation. And um, as, as Christy said, um, really, were quite intrigued with the triple um, bottom line results um, that uh, this program will hope to yield. And so with that, um, we ask that you continue to stay engaged. Um, it is our intent to do that, um, both from Enterprise and Wells Fargo to really benefit from the over 800 organizations that um, originally um, applied. And so there is tremendous opportunities for us to, to learn and to leverage. And we look forward to doing um, that today in a meaningful way. So with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Christy. Thanks so much, Connie. Following our panel discussion today, we will have time for questions and answers. And we encourage you to submit your questions in the Q&A feature of today's Zoom. We'll get to as many questions as possible in the last 10 or 15 minutes of our time together today. If you are engaged in this conversation through social media, please use the hashtag housing breakthrough in your posts. So now let's get started. I will turn it over to today's moderator, Michelle Connor, 
president and CEO of Forterra. Michelle, thank you so much for moderating and participating in today's discussion. I'll ask that you introduce yourself as well as our esteemed panelists. Take it away. I think you're on mute, Michelle. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you for that. Uh, Christine, Connie, thank you for uh, the kickoff to today's conversation. I'm uh, really looking forward to hearing the interactions between Dr. Jerry Franklin, Stefan Zog, and Toby Levy from Forterra. Um, as she said, I'm Michelle Connor. I'm the president and CEO of Forterra, and it has been my absolute privilege to work and grow with Forterra as a regional conservation and community sustainability organization for nearly 28 years. Um, we're joined today by Dr. Jerry Franklin, who is a world-renowned forest ecologist and a leading authority on sustainable forest management and the maintenance of healthy ecosystems. His early research in the, uh, published originally in 1981 on old growth forests uh, culminated in a game-changing paper called Ecological Characteristics of Old Growth for Forests, Douglas Fir Forest. Jerry is a University of Washington professor emeritus and um, uh, leader within the School of Environment and Forest Resources at the University of Washington. Stefan Zog is the CFO of a highly respected third generation family owned timber engineering and construction business in Switzerland, Zog AG. Zog is a leading expert in CLT based homes, apartments and schools and is our uh, modular CLT fabrication partner. And Toby Levy is my colleague and the leader of uh, Forterra's transactions and real estate development team and the manager of Forterra Strong Communities Fund, which provides social impact capital to support the forest to home model alongside the Wells Fargo and Enterprise uh, grant funds. Toby has been working in mass timber since 2013 and brought that expertise to Forterra and has served as the developer and builder of two of the US's first two mass timber buildings in New York and New England. Before we start in the panel discussion, I'd like to uh, orient everybody to the forest to home uh, sort of framework. And um, if we can bring up the infographic that shares that um, framework, our panelists will be speaking to the aspects of this framework. And so I wanna walk everybody through it. And then at the end of the panel discussion, we'll swing back um, to tie it all back together again. So Forterra is an organization that drives land-based solutions that support both people and nature to thrive in coexistence. The housing affordability breakthrough challenge connects fundamentally to our mission and to our forest to home integrated model. And I wanna especially thank Wells Fargo and Enterprise Community Partners for the encouragement and support and for helping us share our story with all of you who've joined us today. We do hope our story offers inspirations to you in your own work and in your own communities with the important efforts you are each leading. As a triple bottom line institution, we are reintegrating the supply chain to achieve our objectives and to overcome some of the challenges that have come from an economic focus on short-term returns. And each of our panelists will be speaking to that. So first, starting with the conservation of working forests, Conservation easements, which are legal protections to remove development pressures on forest land, and conservation harvests, distinct from traditional industrial forest harvest, protect habitat and working forests and provide access over the long term to the ecological benefits uh, those forests provide. Um, responsibly managed and thin timber is a source of our supply chain in the forest to home uh, model, and Jerry will speak in greater detail on this. Secondly, the opportunity to create rural living wage jobs and reconnecting our urban economies to our rural economies. Locally produced modular cross laminate timber generates local jobs for everything from forest stewardship to high-tech manufacturing. And Stefan will speak at greater length to this aspect of our forest to home model. And finally, our uh, two elements on building sustainable homes and building social equity through home ownership. Toby will speak to this. And um, from our point of view, modular cross laminate timber reduces both the total cost of construction and the environmental impact of construction. And for those of you uh, tracking our climate crises, construction is one of the primary generators of uh, carbon pollution in the US today. And by fostering affordability through uh, unique financing tools, 
forced to home model helps to create equitable distribution of wealth and to prevent community displacement. With that, we're gonna start the panel conversation and we've got a good amount of time on this. So we'll start by having each of the panels set up their element of the forest to home model and hopefully have a few minutes towards the end for interchanges between the panelists. So I'm gonna kick it off first by turning um, the forum over to Dr. Jerry Franklin and uh, invite uh, Dr. Franklin to speak on the management of forests for both ecological and um, uh, timber production uh, in terms of values that are produced by the forest lands. Jerry? You bet. Obviously, for a program like this, we really want the wood to be coming from landscapes that would be managed, being managed in ways that uh, sustain both the ecological values as well as the economic values. And I might also add cultural values. I'd like to suggest, uh, just for the moment, uh, begin by saying that we need to be careful about the language that we use. And we often talk about healthy forests, but a healthy forest is very much in the eye of be the beholder. And so uh, what a, an investment person might think is a healthy forest isn't what I would consider to be a healthy forest as an ecologist. Similarly, we want forests that are sustainable, but in this century, sustainability is not about planting trees after you cut them. It is about having forests that are resistant and resilient in the face of the kinds of changes and disturbances that are occurring. And so I often talk in terms of what we want are forests that are managed in ways that maintain the full array of functional capabilities. We want fully functional forests. And that means forests that are managed in ways that maintain other values, that protect the watersheds, that provide the wildlife habitat, that sequester carbon, as well as provide wood uh, for building homes. And uh, really the neat thing about this program is by ensuring that we get our wood from those kinds of sources, uh, we can uh, not only feel good about where the wood is coming from, but we can actually encourage uh, additional people to take up that kind of management and uh, even perhaps encourage some of the investment uh, organizations to begin to do things in a more ecologically credible way. Currently, a great deal of our industrial forest lands here in the Northwest are actually managed uh, solely to provide maximum return on investment. And when you do that, it's really impossible to sustain the other forest functions, the other forest values. Uh, is it easy to do this kind of thing? Yes, it really is, but not if your sole focus is on maximizing return on investment by growing forests on very short rotations. And uh, what we really need to be thinking about is sourcing the woods, uh, that we're going to be using from lands that are being managed in ways that uh, we can recognize very readily. For example, there are lands where the forests are being managed on longer rotations. Uh, there are forests that are being managed with uh, what I call retention harvesting, where we don't do clean cutting uh, as is done on a lot of investment lands. Uh, we look for sources that make uh, very limited or no use at all of chemicals, uh, herbicides, pesticides in their, uh, in their management activities. And um, uh, we look for forests that are being managed with a diversity of species. Uh, so rather than uh, monocultures, uh, which has been typical of the investment lands. We're looking for people that are managing their forests in ways that uh, uh, involve stands that are diverse in composition and in terms of their structure. 
And so, you know, it, it turns out to be uh, relatively easy to do this if you are willing, in fact, to take a longer view of management and to manage in ways that are going to sustain uh, habitat, that are going to provide watershed protection. Uh, and uh, interestingly, by growing forests on longer rotations, uh, you sequester a great deal more carbon and actually produce more wood than you do on these very short rotations. So uh, it's, it's uh, quite possible to manage these forests for a diversity of functions or values. And we need to be looking for uh, sourcing the wood from those kinds of, of lands uh, and a great deal of the private forest lands uh, are or could be managed in that way, as well as the public lands. And uh, we need to be encouraging the people that are currently doing that kind of activity by supporting them in the marketplace. They have a difficult time competing uh, with uh, investment uh, fiber farms uh, which can produce the wood cheaper, albeit of lower quality, uh, and at the cost, of course, of the other forest functions. I hey, think Jerry. that's all I need to say. Yeah, you know, for, for the benefit of the audience, since some folks are Northwesterners, but um, we have guests from all over the country, uh, can you paint from a personal perspective for the audience what it would feel like to stand in an industrial forest or a clear cut versus a forest that was selectively harvested to grow those big old trees and sustain the ecosystem um, that uh, surrounds the forest. Can you paint a picture and maybe why that connects so, so much to you personally, your passion? Sure, and if you're standing, uh, you know, uh, in an investment property that's being managed on short rotations, what you're going to see is a crop. You're going to see a lot of small uh, trees of the same size. Um, they're all going to be green. There isn't going to be any dead wood out there at all to provide habitat. And um, uh, so it's going to be a very simple system. It is a farm. It is a fiber farm. Uh, that's how those lands are managed. If, you're ma if, on the other hand, you're visiting a forest property that's being managed for ecological values as well as wood production, what you're going to encounter is a forest that has a diversity of tree species present in it and has uh, a diversity of tree sizes. Uh, so you're going to have young trees as well as old trees present in that forest. And interestingly, and I, I, I have to mention this, uh, a fully functional forest is always going to have some, some standing dead and down trees in it. They're just so critical as habitat for wildlife. So that is not an unhealthy thing. Ecologically, it is a very healthy thing. Thank you. So I am now gonna turn it to Stefan to talk about cross-laminate timber and maybe sort of in the same spirit of um, how Jerry wrapped his talk, maybe start your talk by talking about how it feels to stand in a mass timber building um, and the experience of being in a mass timber building versus say a steel and concrete building. Well, you, you feel it that in the first minute, it's uh, it, it is breathing. It is more more you you more, you feel much more comfortable in a in a wooden building than in a concrete building. But again, you see, you, you have every every material has its 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 purpose and its right to exist. And what we shouldn't do is change everything into timber and CLT. I guess this is a uh, one thing uh, that you you should take away. Um, but talking about CLT, CLT means modular and modular means prefabrication. And the timber industry is basically a very, very traditional industry. And now we're combining the tradition with a modern manufacturing business. 
And that's, uh, that's sort of the challenge, but this is also providing a lot of opportunities. And I guess in a rural, rural area, you can provide basic jobs, very few basic jobs, but you can, uh, you can also uh, uh, have very technical and uh, very, very uh, uh, exper uh, um, highly trained job. Let's say you need carpenters, you need technic technicians that understand the CNC machines, you need engineers, and uh, we will try to train those people in this area. The, the, our, our goal is that we can bring sort of our experience, our tradition over to your rural, rural area and uh, train your people the way we talk, do it here. Yeah, talk a little bit about that tradition in your communities and how it engages um, people from diverse technical backgrounds and skill sets. Uh, in a rural community, because one of the things that's happened in our rural towns is those opportunities have been eliminated and even uh, low, low wage jobs are hard to come by. Um, so talk a little bit about how that looks differently in um, your communities. Well, we're coming, actually our, our company is based in a rural area and we have people within uh, a 10 to maybe 40 minutes distance and those people i think it is important that we can provide such jobs so, so they are their life balance is okay and we are our uh, our um, uh, success is that we have low fluctuation we have very loyal people and if you provide uh, a safe environment i guess you can keep those people because once you you lose experience in, in, this, in this area. You lose people that are behind the CNC machine. You're losing a lot of knowledge. And you have to keep them, you have to train them, and you have to sort of uh, be with them. And what are the benefits of um, prefabrication and modular construction over um, using two by four and you know, cement podium construction, which is very typical of multifamily housing in the U.S. in uh, communities like uh, in the Puget Sound region. Well, the main the main difference is that you can shorten the construction time because you are prefabricating. You can parallel to the foundation. You can do the prefabrication, and you 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 your uh, 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 time to uh, to market you you can shorten very much, but the most important thing for prefabrication is the design process. And this has to be very, very thorough. And what we experience here in Europe, they didn't, re they didn't really get it. Although we we're doing it, we do the prefabrication, but a lot of people, they don't get how, how the design process is done. You need time, it needs to be precise in order to provide a high quality product that comes to the site. And for your family company, you're now a third generation uh, timber uh, manufacturing uh, firm. Why are you personally excited about cross laminate timber? Um, because you can, you can reach other, uh, you can build higher, you can build uh, in planes. We can think in planes and not in sticks or beams or columns. I'm an engineer. And I, I, was, I was trained to, to, every, to, to uh, simplify everything into a beam or a column. Now we can think in plates, biaxial bending, and we didn't have that before. So it opens a very, very, uh, it, it's a new horizon. Very it's cool. fantastic. Very cool. So Toby, um, you joined Forterran at the time we did land, we did real estate, and we also were advocating for this uh, relatively new to the US technology of cross laminate timber, even though it's um, been used in other parts of the world uh, for a long time. And you saw the opportunity to marry together Forterra's concern about the well being of forests with the well being of uh, communities. Um, through cross laminate timber. Um, can you share a little bit about what excites you about um, the affordability of this technology and how it connects to community well being? Sure. Um, 
And I'll say, because I've had the most contact with um, Christy at Enterprise and now with Connie at Wells Fargo, um, thank you for your support of this group. It's really um, wonderful to have someone take a risk on an entrepreneurial team, um, which is what the Forterra team has been and the Saug team has been. Um, this is risky business trying to um, disrupt this supply chain that we call um, forest to home, but what is effectively um, our ecological environment and our built environment together. And without the Wells Fargo's and enterprises, it's too expensive for the commercial sector to try this. Um, so we have great thanks there. I think from an affordability point of view, what we're really talking about is a different set of partnerships to achieve a vertical supply chain. And what's happened in the US and to some degree in Europe since basically the civil war is that increasing layers of cost have been built into that vertical supply chain. And only new and innovative partnerships in our opinion can create an efficiency there. And that's what this group has been working on. Um, from Stefan who's here, um, we have another Swiss partner um, named Künzli, who's worked with us now for two years and has also been bringing technology to the US um, to our work with Methune um, on the entire building system. Thank you for that. And our backers, we have wonderful backers in Edwards Mother Earth Foundation, um, many others who have been there for the past three and a half years. And they've really enabled us to bridge future partnerships with people like Hampton and the big timber companies who um, are managing most of our forests, all the way down to the communities we work with. We work very closely with the Somali community, with Abu Bakr, um, with Yakima Nation and other tribes, the Quinault. Um, those are the partnerships in our view that make up the future of the supply chain. Not increasing levels of subcontracting, which is basically an increase in marginal cost over every time a product is moved. There's an old saying in wood that what is the, what is the cost of wood? And it's how many times you move it. And that's a good metaphor for what we're doing. We're moving the wood so many times to get from our forest to our homes that it's getting very expensive. And it's getting very expensive both both in cost and in environmental cost. And if we can eliminate many of those layers and use these partnerships to create a di direct order, for example, between a tribe and a forest, a tribe for their affordable housing and a forest um, that might be owned by Forterra, it might be owned by Warehouser, it might be owned by Hampton. If we can reconnect that link, we can do very big things and we can reduce costs. That's the key to affordability for us, Michelle, I think. Toby and Stefan, maybe each of you could take uh, some piece of this. Can you describe what cross laminate timber is and how it connects to older technology? I mean, if you go into old buildings in Seattle, you see these magnificent beams and posts of essentially old growth, you know, the trunks of old growth trees that have been planed into um, massive beams. And yet places like Seattle also suffered enormous fires. And so there was a shift from um, these old big tree beams uh, to two by fours and to steel and concrete. Can you talk a little bit about um, what cross laminate timber means for us and what it is, what it just like physically described for the audience, what it is? Toby, you wanna to take a first run and then shift it to Stefan? Sure. So it's it's not actually a new uh, product. It was one of the interesting things is that there was actually a patent put in in Tacoma in 1923 for cross laminated timber. What is new is the manufacturing technology in order to produce it at a cost that's actually affordable. And it is effectively glued large elements that are glued together. Those elements you can prefabricate into single Lego pieces, or you can put multiple Lego pieces together in a factory and create a module. 
And what Stefan and, and Central European leaders have been able to do is get further and further into the factory on that prefabrication. Mass timber is just a way to do that by going all the way down to the single, whether it's a two by four A or another piece of lumber and take that all the, all the way through the chain. Can, can, can Stefan, can you describe how big a panel is or a beam? and sort of give the audience a sense of scale of what we're talking about here? You can produce uh, uh, plates on up to four meters and more, and then a length of uh, 22 meters and more. It, it depends on the manufacturer and the thickness of, uh, let's say, 32 to 400 millimeters, 320 to 400 millimeters. But, Basically, you take you take uh, lumber's uh, lumber boards this like this, and then you take another layer of lumber boards like this. You glue them together, and then you have a you have a panel. And the panel and works know. like cement, right? In terms of how it handles weight, it's a, like the lateral, and then the beams are like replaced steel theoretically. And so you, you sort of if you if you put them uh, crosswise together, you sort of homogenizes your the physical properties in in several directions and but your first question was the beam and the, the clt uh, what you do is with all industrial fabricated wood products you chop the wood you chop the the the, the trunk of wood into small pieces you dry it you glue it and then you you can you can uh, uh, increase the the resistance and then you don't need such a trunk you only need this trunk. Very cool. Doesn't Toby, agree. anything you would add to that? No, it, it it's a bridge and the Europeans are ahead of us, but I think with many American things, we have the chance to leapfrog them. And Stefan's here to help us do that. You, you see the Americans, you're not afraid of it. You just do it. There That's the difference to the, to, compared to the Europeans. Hey, Toby, before, um, I wanna make sure we carve some time to talk about cooperative ownership and how the affordability of the product through the pre-manufacturing and um, modular system makes uh, the co-op structure, especially limited equity co-op structure, relevant to the Northwest in a way that it might not otherwise be. Sure. So. Our sense, and there's not much, there are not many studies to prove this out, but our sense is that LIHTC funding, the traditional source of funding for affordable housing is effectively capped. There is not an, it's not an unlimited um, pot of money to support housing affordability. At the same time, our demand for housing is accelerated and it's massive, um, which means that you just have too much demand for the supply which means that there is inflation and construction costs, which then plays into the supply problem. And this feedback, this feedback circle continues until you have what we have today, which is it's basically in our city in Seattle impossible to find a home for less than $700,000. And yes, it's possible to do what um, traditional affordable housing developers are doing and to do it extremely well as the Seattle developers do. Seattle's produced more affordable housing than San Francisco. And that's not on a per capita basis, that's on an absolute basis, even though San Francisco is a much bigger city. What Seattle doesn't have and many other US cities don't have is a way to deliver affordable ownership. And that is an even more limited pot of money in our experience. And if we're gonna affect the cost of that type of housing, we have to go into the vertical supply chain cost. And to disrupt that, we need technology. And that's mass timber for us. There are other technologies out there that are also um, inspiring that um, this same grant is supporting. But for us, this is really a route to ownership. And ownership means less displacement of community. There's a lot of evidence around that, it, that you can't only have rental, you really need ownership. So that's one bridge. The other bridge is that how can we expect there to be environmental justice in our society if there is not social justice in our communities? And it's an unrealistic ask in our view that we can 
preserve, conserve, protect our natural environment if we're not protecting our most marginalized communities. And that's the other theoretical connection between the two. We have to build better and we have to build cheaper and we have to be willing to um, give more equitable access to our homes if we are going to protect our natural environment. Can you talk a little bit more specifically about the mechanics for wealth creation for rural and tribal communities and for the communities in our cities that have not been given access uh, to the supports for wealth creation? I know. So this is, um, it's a national problem, but it's a West Coast problem too. We don't have co-ops um, in Seattle. There's a very limited number. And cooperatives are effectively where residents together own a corporation that borrows a sum of money to finance the construction of their homes. And that means a master loan to a community, um, which traditionally was prohibited in the state of Washington indirectly um, through an attempt by the legislature to protect individual owners from blanket loans. Um, but what cooperatives have been shown to do on the East Coast is to enable cheaper ownership because there are federal um, guarantee programs that enable 40 year fixed rate low cost um, loans. And those are a very good fit for um, technology and technology based construction innovation because they're a cheaper source of money. And they're more stable if you're able to develop as an organization expertise in those loan products. So ownership again bridges into um, fiber and timber through an existing off the shelf um, loan product um, that is very long lead time, but is very effective in creating empowered communities. And Toby, so uh, Jerry kicked us off by talking about the possibility of harvesting trees in a way that supports ecology and um, greater volumes of timber. Talk about um, your thinking of, and the work your team has been doing on sourcing timber and working in um, cooperation with rural communities and tribes on that. Well, we, we have in Washington, I think the amazing opportunity of both big timber, which represents an incredibly strong tradition in um, introducing wood in place of concrete into our um, economic system. And that is not a given. So most of Europe is, does not do wood construction even close to the amount that we do. And that's thanks to our industry. At the same time, we have groups, um, tribes who have thousands of years of experience in land management and might not have the scientific knowledge that Jerry, you have, but have the stewardship tradition um, in order to help to steward our lands. If we combine those, um, I think Forest to Home brings both of those expertise to the table and creates a pull for well-managed forests so that we can go to, for example, in Darrington to our neighbor next door to Hampton and say, hey, we really need to work with you. And we know you are motivated for the health of our forest. Let's work together to go and source fiber in a sustainable way. And I'm just using that as an example um, because they've been wonderful at doing that. And those partnerships, we want to continue. Um, and the tribes similarly see a way to connect their stewardship um, to their homes. Can you speak a little bit, Toby, um, one more question for you on why CLT as a product allows us to embark on what fundamentally will be more expensive timber harvest, timber management regimens, um, and the stability that you see in CLT as a product to purchase versus say two by fours or steel? Developers, in our experience, value certainty as much as cost. And CLT, when used in its best form, creates a certainty of cost because one is able to divorce it from the volatile economic cycle of lumber. Um, and that's through a series of mechanisms, both offtake agreements, or in our case, going up, up stream into the production business, that certainty 
creates a certainty around financing and there is a value to certainty of cost that it becomes an efficiency. Because if you look at most builders, most developers, and most lenders, they are building in an enormous contingency that has a cost. And there's an incredible amount of uncertainty that has a cost. If you can know that your fiber and your partnerships that deliver fiber and your manufacturing are locked in and you have long-term partnerships, and Stefan, I know you're in the third generation of some partnerships, um, you can decrease the cost. Um, and I was gonna suggest one of the most amazing stories I've heard from uh, Stefan is around um, your uh, ancestors work around prefabrication in barns in rural Switzerland, um, because what we're doing isn't new, actually. I think we're just trying to get the best out of um, an older model. Stefan, could you share that uh, with us? I, I'd love to hear that story too. Oh, absolutely. It's a, uh, well, my, uh, my, uh, uh, father and they started to do a uh, prefabricated uh, barns and they sort of split uh, Switzerland in two halves with another company which is good for price uh, but then they, uh, they they highly they highly prefabricated those barns and standardized details and this was in the 80s and then sort of later later in the 90s everybody wanted to to have its own uh, special barn and this standard 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 standardization standardization got lost but now as as toby said it's nothing new the only the only difference is it's it's the quality of the product it's much much higher and it needs a little more much more time to design it but once it's done it's it's actually not complicated it's the logistics that is important, and in our in our partnership with uh, Forterra and Whitehorse, actually the CLT manufacturer is, is just next door, and we uh, we can eliminate one leg of transportation, which is again cost, which is we protect uh, the environment. We don't we don't uh, have a, a excess of fuel, and we don't have to wrap up uh, the the CLT again into plastic. It's it's a big thing having everything in house. It's amazing. Stefan, for anybody who lives in a community, we can kind of envision what it looks like to build a frame building, a multifamily building where, you know, you've got a carpenter up uh, on, you know, the second story framing out a window or whatever that might be. Describe for the audience, sort of paint the picture, sort of as Jerry painted the picture of what it might be to be in a uh, managed um, timber stand versus an ecologically uh, stewarded timber stand. Um, what, how is CLT manufactured into a modular system and how do CNC machines and what are CNC machines and, okay. you know, well, like, what is that? Just paint, paint the picture for, for folks that haven't seen this. Well, as Americans, you, everybody knows Ford, how they built the, this, uh, T whatever I don't know what it what's model it called. T, yeah, model T. Yeah, it, it's this model T. It's it's exactly the same thing. It's you 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 sort of assemble big large pieces of 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 plates into a box, and this this box is moving through the manufacturing site, and at the end of the and the end of this uh, lengthy uh, uh, manufacturing site, there you have your module. Then you stock it, and then that's it. And you put in the, it, the degree of prefabrication is is it can be different, but ideally, uh, the, the floor is in, all the lavabo is in, the dishwasher is in, uh, everything is in. You just take this piece of Lego and then put it in place in a short period of time on the construction site. That's the whole idea. Very cool. Very simple. So before we conclude. I mean, my takeaway, and, and the reason why I get um, passionate about Forterra's work in communities and in the natural environment is to me, it's intuitively rebuilding an ecosystem, reintegrating what has become a disaggregated, disconnected system and community um, set of relations. Jerry, you're an ecologist. 
Can you speak a little bit about the power of integrated systems and the power of reconnecting systems that have been broken to sort of bring us home here? Well, particularly in this century when we're looking for systems that, uh, so social systems, ecological systems, integrated systems that are more resistant and resilient. Uh, obviously, uh, this is, it makes it critical to begin to try to do these kinds of things where we're really paying attention to what's going on from one end of the process to the other end, i.e. where we're getting the wood and how it's being produced all the way to the other end, which is where we're living and where we're working, what kind of structures we're living and working in. And um, what we did at the forest end, and unfortunately, this is what's going on on a lot of the investment forest lands right now, is we have completely separated out uh, that function of producing wood from all of the other values associated with the forest. And they're not just ecological values, they're social values as well. So the emphasis, for example, on short rotations and a global market for the wood has resulted in real disadvantageous conditions for small rural communities, for small non-industrial private forest landowners, for tribes. Uh, and, uh, you know, we need to be looking to correct that. Uh, and I think I have to say that going to the potential cheaper source uh, for wood fiber is not what you want to do. If you do that, you're just going to contribute further to uh, what I consider to be socially underperforming forest land management. We don't want to do that. Yeah. We don't want to damage rural economies, small town economies, uh, which is very much what has happened. And so it's really critical uh, in thinking about this integrated system as you are uh, that uh, you, you recognize in the valuation, in the, in the economics uh, of it, uh, the, the tremendous value of reintegrating our other goals for forest lands. And uh, that doesn't come about through uh, short rotations of uh, plantations of uh, monocultures. It doesn't come that way. Yeah. It comes through integrated management. And just to amplify that on the community side, we, we've got ample documentation that the physical environment, that home ownership, that thriving small businesses in neighborhoods have direct relationships to the public health of those communities. And for communities that have been marginalized from ownership and stability, the public health outcomes are dramatically different and um, less advantageous um, from other communities that are empowered to own and um, given the resources uh, and access to resources that every community needs to thrive. Um, and the forest of home model really connects ecologically to community and cultural well-being too. I mean, the dispossession of ownership and not having access to opportunities for ownership, which has been systemic in the United States, um, is something that our generation can begin to work on in a meaningful and intentional way. And the disadvantaged communities are not just in the big cities and they're not just the Native Americans. They're very much our rural communities, uh, our small towns, uh, you know that very well. Yeah. Uh, they've suffered dramatically economically with the globalization of the world's economy. Yeah. Which brings us, I think, um, to back to full circle to the uh, forest to home model. And uh, we'll just to wrap us, we'll, and before I hand it over to Christy to uh, facilitate some Q and A from the audience, 
just as a reminder, the idea of a reintegrated ecosystem or integrated supply chain is to start by conserving forests that produce all sorts of values, habitat values, cultural values, carbon values, and wood fiber. Um, creating rural living wage jobs that provide people the uh, opportunity for uh, a range of jobs at a range of training levels and in income levels in our communities near the forests that are managed um, for these benefits. And then providing that fiber in a form that's using the best of old and new technology and understanding in our cities and building social equity through home ownership and stability. Um, we can talk about uh, land belonging to people, but we belong in our communities and we belong in the landscape. And um, there's, there's a reciprocity and a responsibility that flows through this model that we believe deeply in. Christy, with that, I will thank the panelists and hand it over to you um, to give the audience a chance to uh, engage with us. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, thank you, Stefan and Dr. Franklin and Toby. Your leadership uh, in this work is, is really inspiring. And, and I'm sure I speak for others in our audience today when I say how interested I am in following this work, um, learning from you all as we are thinking of more responsible and impactful way of, of creating housing for communities, because it's clear we need to be thinking differently about what it means to plan uh, and build homes. So um, thank you all. So with q and a, a couple of great questions have come in already. Um, but I'll start with, uh, you know, I think anytime people hear about a cheaper and faster way to build affordable housing, you pretty quickly become the most popular group in the room. Um, so can you tell us where you are in, in this process? When do you expect to put modular CLT into action? Thanks. So, um, well, the ship with our first, um, the pieces, the Lego pieces, we're using European CLT, we could not get the domestic manufacturer to supply us in time, which gives you a sense of the demand out there. Um, the ship with the first pieces docked yesterday, I think, on the East Coast. It's got to come across the continent now. Um, but the first prototype um, should be done um, by November. And that was an enormous lift um, to its three modules. Um, completed as if they were in a multifamily building. Um, three modules of about um, 14 feet by 28 feet each. Um, and Stefan's team is putting those together in Everett, Washington, um, designed by Methune, together with our uh, mass timber partner, Sticksworks, um, being renamed as White Earth Timber. Um, and that will be available to um, walk through, tour, um, and you'll be seeing a lot about it on social media. Um, COVID pending, it will uh, be in San Francisco for a little while, in Portland for a little while, in Vancouver for a little while, and you can come see it. Um, that's the prototype to work out the kinks in the system and see if um, we can hit a magical number um, of under first under $40,000 a module. So what that means is um, a two bedroom um, for about $120,000 in cost, um, which would be pretty amazing. And then eventually get it even further down. Um, and there's precedent, there's precedent in refugee housing in Germany. There's precedent um, in the modular world in the United States. Um, but the first step is um, the test modules, and then we have another, we have a project behind that of 100 um, units with the Somali community in, in just south of Seattle. Um, and that project is scheduled to be produced as a first project um, in Darrington um, in starting in late 2023. And then there's a, a more significant to scale rollout if the theory proves correct um, for 350 units um, in partnership um, with the black community on the hilltop in Tacoma. And we have two other low rise projects um, with rural communities. And we're hoping and 
Unfortunately, it takes, as any builder will tell you, years to innovate in this space. Um, so we're building a pipeline of projects to incrementally bring that cost down. Um, that's hard to match to a developer because once a developer is funded, they want the product yesterday. Um, and that's our big challenge. Um, but we're trying to match up the demand with the production right now. Great. Yeah, I think I think we're all ready. So um, as, as quickly as you can as you can figure this out and, and produce it, Stefan, and uh, I think the industry is certainly ready. Uh, another question, how will the growing wildfire concerns uh, impact the viability of timber used in housing and how is CLT or might CLT be affected by that? Jerry, you should field the floor. What, I didn't catch the first part of the question. Oh, sorry. Um, how will the growing wildfire concerns impact oh. the viability of timber and how might CLT be affected by that? Well, uh, certainly, you know, the issues with wildfire, but not just wildfire, disturbances uh, in general are on the rise of all types. I mean, drought has been a major problem as well as wildfire. And that's why I said, you know, if we want to talk about sustainable forests, we need to be building forests that have resistance to fire and other disturbances and are resilient. In other words, have an ability to, to do some of the recovery on their own afterwards. And short rotation plantations, fiber farms, have absolutely no resistance and no resilience. They are uh, uh, absolutely highly vulnerable. And all you have to look at is what happened to a great deal of warehouser land down in the Eugene, Oregon, McKenzie River area last September. Uh, and uh, the native forest, while well, some of them burn uh, with high severity, for the most part, a natural forest, forests that have complexity in them, uh, won't burn in, uh, with the same level of uh, extensive high intensity fire that the fiber farms or the plantations will. Uh, and so, uh, again, building forests that are, uh, are fully ecologically functional or fulfilling all of their capacities and sustaining those through a management regime that is ecologically sensitive provides you with a lot more resistance and resilience. Does that mean that you're not going to ever experience wildfires? No, that is an issue. Do I think that wildfire is actually going to create a shortage of material? I do not. Uh, I don't think uh, even with the kinds of uh, fire regimes that we've experienced here in the Northwest recently that, no, I don't think that's going to uh, affect our supply of raw material for this product. Anyone else want to add to that? Again, I just want to say that we're going to have forests that are a lot more resistant and resilient if we manage them with ecological focus as well as an economic focus. Uh, so uh, that ought to help. Thank you, Jerry. A couple of questions um, coming in about uh, the actual cost of using modular CLT in a development. Do you have any sense as to what cost efficiencies uh, this product will, um, will bring to a development? Or could you provide maybe a comparison of traditional development using traditional materials versus using a product like this? And how, how, how is it penciling out in, in your, um, as you're looking at this at, at this point in the process? 
Well, I can let Stefan talk to European examples, but on our very uh, recent uh, example, we do have um, hard bids on our first two, two scale project and um, our system right now prices at 18% cheaper than the traditional um, bid. That said, um, that took an enormous uh, amount of investment to get there. And I think this is why we're a nonprofit because that investment from Wells Fargo and from enterprise means that we don't have to pay that R&D money back. If we had to amortize that R&D money over the first 300 units, it wouldn't be, right? So that type of subsidy in a sense replaces LIHTC subsidy, but it's much more long-term in our opinion because the benefits of it can be translated to other developers. Um, but on a bidding basis, it translates out, um, but that's, that's the experiment of the next 24 months to see if in reality that's true as well. Stefan, is there a European uh, rule of thumb you wanna share around um, yeah, the rule of thumb is yeah. The rule of thumb is they're, they're cost-wise they're both the same, but with a uh, with a, this kind of a system that we 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 tr we're trying to provide is you, you're much faster, and this is the benefit. And as higher the building, the 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 the, the faster you are on the market, and and it is you 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 can you can get rent rental effect. It's just it's just the speed. But cost-wise, it's the same. And that, on our project, just to reinforce that, the what a contractor in the US calls general conditions and general requirements can run in the millions per month. So that time, that's a huge contributor to the 18% savings. It's a big number. Thank you. Um, talking about how to, how to engage, how to, how to get started in thinking about using, um, using a product like this. How, how would you advise other developers around the country to um, access CLT or engage with you all as you are uh, continuing to go through this process? Or if there's another CLT factory uh, in another part of the country, how, what's the, how, how do you get involved in, um, in considering this product in a development? I think come, come see us when we finish this first one. Um, and it, it's an open source product. Um, that's part of our, our mission, um, our corporate purpose. So we're sharing the designs freely um, with, you do have to be a nonprofit um, affordable housing developer to access that. Um, but the learnings we're sharing universally because there's just a basic lack of housing. There is a connection between just total volume of housing and affordability of housing. And so the more we can make it available, the more we fulfill our mission. Maybe I can add something. If there are designers out there, please ask the manufacturers of CLT and the modular builders. When you have an idea, ask them in a very early stage because they will tell you use standard formats. If you use standard formats, you don't have any waste. It's, it's, and, and you, you save money. It's, it's all about logistics and processing and, and, and you need to know those, those kind of grids, those measures, ask the manufacturer. They will help you. Great. And then um, a question directed to you, Stefan, around what are the, the capital needs and requirements for bringing a CLT wood plant online? Uh, how, how, how can we have more places creating this product? What does it take? I think I give, I give this uh, uh, question back to Toby. <laughs> A lot more than we thought. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's true. It started as a, um, I think, a $35 million project of a fully vertically integrated mass timber production and modular facility. And it 
it's ended up on close of finance, it's going to be a hundred million dollars. Um, I don't think every market has to go that far. Um, Seattle happens to have an incredibly fast rate of growth. Our neighbors in Tacoma have our top 10 city in the U.S. Pierce County, where Tacoma is, is the fastest growing county in the U.S., um, which is why this is a wonderful place for this experiment. Um, you might notice that um, Katera was bought out of, their plant was bought out of bankruptcy. Um, and that's a whole nother discussion about why plant doesn't work in the US and where it doesn't work um, for $50 million. And that's probably a fair market price to build just a mass timber plant. If you look at the European example, in some parts of the Northeastern Alps in Austria, there is almost one plant per major valley, per major uh, population center. And major population center could be 30,000 people. Um, there is space for hundreds of these plants in the US, the same way there was space in the 19th century for thousands of mills in the US. Um, we certainly have the fiber here and we certainly have the innovative drive. Um, and again, we're happy to share learnings around what it took over the past five years to get to this place with this project. Have a follow up to that. Um, is there anything preventing CLT techniques from being applied to other tree species in different parts of the country? Uh, the example provided in this question is Appalachia. There have been hardwood tests, um, eastern hardwood tests, I think with red oak or a kind of oak. Um, and there has been, I think that they were led by um, a nonprofit in Massachusetts whose name I can't remember. Um, and they've been somewhat successful. Um, it was not successful with some of the medium hardwoods um, um, like alder, but it was successful um, with three species, if I remember correctly, on the East Coast. Um, it's a bit of an unknown. Um, and as many people will tell you, the Northeast hardwood corridor is a huge opportunity. They also haven't done um, the harvesting that we haven't done or have done. They're in a very similar situation. Um, the other unexploited fiber back to the West Coast again for CLT is hemlock, which can dry in a very wonky way, but um, because of its lower cost represents an opportunity. Um, Stefan and, and, um, and Michelle and Tobin, Feel free, Michelle, to, to chime in to uh, answer these questions as well. Um, what is the opportunity for customization as the design and fabrication process um, is taking place to meet different needs around individual preference, um, cultural preference, um, as you're uh, considering a, a, a modular prototype? Stefan, that's definitely for you. I think the I think what I understand the question to be is the balance between standardization and custom in in prefabricated construction. Well, I remind you of the T of the T, model T. The, the 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 more the more similarities you have, or the more pieces are are the same, it's 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 the better, and it's the cheaper. But if you if you do the right design and you know when to do when, which module has to be customized if you know that and it is designed as well again and it's prepared all the steps are pre-assembled before then it's okay too it's all about design and logistics all right i think we'll um have maybe one or, or two more questions um we talked about um, this model and, and these pilots focusing on high rise or higher um, uh, density construction. Do you also expect that the cost savings would be um, applied maybe at a similar rate or, or different when thinking about garden style apartments, mid rise construction, or even single family homes? For sure. Um, a garden style. Um... I know Craig Curtis at Methune has put a lot of effort into that with success um, when, during his time uh, at Katera. 
Um, we're gonna try with single family homes. We're, we're, that's next up, we're gonna try. And there are a lot of people saying, no, you can't do it. Um, even out of Europe, because single family homes in Europe are so much higher quality. Um, I think we believe we have to do it. I visited um, some modules that were delivered, um, traditional uh, aluminum stick frame modules up in the mountains on the east side yesterday, um, where the developer proudly told us that his homes lasted 37 years, um, which is not, in our view, a sustainable way of building our homes. If we have to throw out our homes every 37 years, we're in trouble. So there's a there we believe strongly there's an opportunity there. All right. I think our final question is when will we see the first all CLT for Terra building? 2024. All right, well, it's a quick and simple answer. Thank you, Toby. And thank you all um, once again uh, for, um, for joining us today. I am uh, really excited to, to let everyone know all of our participants today. We will be sharing out a recording of today's webinar. So please feel free to share that with uh, your colleagues and partners and others who might be interested in this work. Um, and again, I encourage you to stay informed about how Forterra, um, as well as our other challenge winners, uh, continue to execute on their housing affordability solutions. And you can do that by uh, subscribing to news and updates on the housingbreakthrough.org site. So with that, um, I hope you all stay safe, uh, be well, and thanks again for joining us today. Goodbye.